So welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris, and today I am joined with a good friend, uh, Jonathan Cowart. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for agreeing to do this. I, you know, Jonathan and I go back a few years, and I'm, I am just so amazed at everything you've accomplished, Jonathan, so far. And I just, every time we talk, every time you, we have a meeting about your progress with your research, it's just so exciting to hear about the stuff you're doing. So, not to make you nervous or anything like that, but this guy's amazing, folks. You're going to really love to hear from him. I really appreciate that. I uh, think you built me up a little bit much there. <laughs> I know, I know. That's how you feel, right? But seriously, so Jonathan, I would describe Jonathan, and I'm going to let him give his background here in a second. But I would say Jonathan is probably the one of the few people in the world that fully understand manatee reproduction. There are not many, a small handful around this planet that understand about these creatures, how they reproduce, and then some of the really groundbreaking research that Jonathan's doing in manatees is what we're going to talk about today. So, so I know sitting in your shoes, you don't see it, but trust me, trust me, you're, you're doing some amazing work for these animals. So do you mind just giving the listeners a, a brief background about, you know, where you are in school, I guess, and, and how you got into manatee research? Certainly. Um, so I'm actually currently in my fourth year of my PhD program here at the University of Florida in the Aquatic Animal Health Program. Um, and I focus mainly on the male reproductive physiology in West Indian manatees. And uh, specifically, a lot of what I focus on is looking at like sperm structure, uh, seminal fluid components, uh, semen characterization, and uh, it's a little bit of a, a, a taboo subject, but it, it provides a lot of uh, comical dinner conversation <laughs> yeah. uh, talking to people. Um, but it, it's actually been really interesting because when I entered into the program well, with my advisor, Dr. Iska Larkin, I actually planned to look at uh, reproductive hormones in female manatees. And she currently had a master's student that was doing some uh, gross anatomical and histological descriptions of the male reproductive tract. And we decided to kind of build upon that. And actually, you know, getting semen collections was, as we, we kind of termed it, was the uh, icing on the cake, uh, per se. And everything just kind of fell in line and the the project developed a lot further and a lot quicker than we both imagined and and so it's been actually very exciting to to work on this and and then the the many collaborations that have come out of it as well mm -hmm. and the many hands that are in the pot kind of everyone that we're working with and um, branching out from not only manatees but hopefully into some other uh, of the more cryptic marine mammals right and I you know, when you first approached me about this project, I like jumped on board. I was like, heck yeah. You know, I definitely want to uh, be a part of this. And then, you know, I, I'm sure the story we're going to flush out a little bit more over the next hour. But, you know, I was really started diving into this and realizing the manatee, elephant, rock hyrex, those three species are so closely related. So anyways, we're going to we're going to get to the folks. So your your research has taken you around the world now, right? Too, it it has. It's actually um, that's one of the the perks of being a graduate student is is traveling to a lot of places where sometimes we don't uh, normally go either on vacation or or whatnot. And so it's actually um, taken me over to uh, South Africa where we've done some work uh, in the Rock Hyrax with a a pretty beloved collaborator over there, uh, Dr. Gerhard Vanderhorst. Um, and then it's also taken us over to uh, Puerto Rico, where we've collaborated heavily with the uh, Manatee Conservation Center down uh, in Bayamon as part of the uh, Inner American University there. And, and they have really helped us uh, by collecting some of the samples. Um, well, I should say sharing some of those samples um, that they do for, for routine health assessments. And so we've been able to take advantage of of uh, some of the work that they've done in, in being able to collect those samples and use some more modern technology to start delving in and actually 
filling some of those gaps that we have in this knowledge uh, of male reproductive physiology in the species. Right. It, it, it's funny. We actually, in our naked mole rats, we actually bring up prof because he's one of the few people that have actually looked at it in naked mole rats as far as male reproduction. So it, again, it's a small world. He, he certainly can uh, uh, get sperm from any species. Uh, he, he's gone from mollusks uh, all the way up the, up the, uh, the trophic level. So yeah, I mean, African elephants. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So where did you, I mean, your work in conservation, when did that bug hit you? Um, I would definitely say, I mean, maybe I'm a little bit different than a lot of the other, I guess, conservations out, conservationists out at there. But uh, my, my conservation background actually really developed in my undergrad at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington, I was always interested in biology and science. Um, that, was, that was definitely a subject I excelled at in high school um, and, and in other secondary school. But actually getting into kind of the, the junior and senior year of my, of my undergraduate work, uh, where I worked a little bit with the stranding program through UNCW, uh, they really helped build that kind of taking the biology and linking it with ecology and conservation. And, and so while I guess I would say my, my conservation background or involvement came a lot later uh, than, than maybe a lot of other people, um, it really is founded in, in a really deep interest in marine science and marine biology. So, you know, I really want to get your take on manatees. And I, and I just want to, I guess I just want to jump there first. You, each year, you have been doing a lot of necropsies on manatees. What is causing their decline, I guess, or what is their cause of mortality for most of them in Florida? Well, in, in Florida, it certainly is, you know, one of the, one of the top threats that the, the Florida manatee faces is certainly human activities such as uh, watercraft strikes, you know, but there are other natural causes. I mean, it, it's not all kind of doom and gloom on the, the human side. You know, we have cold stress that, that really uh, that they suffer from um, during the winter months. Uh, there's red tide events that, that we lose manatees at. But, you know, a lot of it is, is water, you know, it's human activity, is, is watercraft strikes, um, entanglement, uh, things like that. Um, and, and it's really unfortunate. I mean, the, the catalog of, of kind of photo identification for, for manatees is all based on scarring patterns. And so, uh, and you can track the development of these scars over time uh, through these catalogs. As they identify these individuals, you can see how these scar patterns may may change. Um, and there's more and more of these, of these manatees that bear scars. Um, but they're luckily they're, they're very resilient animals and they, they kind of get through a lot more than you would imagine, you know, living with, you know, maybe a broken rib or, you know, um, they, they have a pretty good immune system. And, and so they, they bear a hard brunt, but they come back kind of full force and, they really just keep on on kicking. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, and that that's really good for them. But I mean, every year we've got more and more people on the water, and we unfortunately, I mean, one of the things that I was very surprised at in in Florida was that you know just about anybody over a certain age can can rent a boat <laughs> just by showing their driver's license. Um, and so you have, you know, maybe somebody out of state or maybe somebody that is not experienced with boats and, you know, that don't always obey the, the posted uh, speed limit signs for, you know, maybe a no wake zone. And, you know, there's been a lot of research and a lot of effort going into where to put up these slow speed zones, uh, especially for, um, you know, different seasons or, or really making sure that the, that as much care is, is taken to not fully restrict a boater's kind of right or to access the water. But I mean, we have to consider the fact that we we're entering an aquatic habitat and, and we have to take care of the animals that are, that live fully within that, that environment and, and 
do as much as we can to really uh, minimize our our effect in that environment. And and it's you know it's truly kind of uh, heartbreaking you know to be out on the water and to see how many people ignore those slow speed zones. How many people? I mean, uh, you know, just in my couple years in Florida, it, it's really a split kind of divide where you get a lot of people who generally just don't like manatees because you know it's oh we have to go through all the slow speed zones and it takes so much longer to get out to the ocean or we can't you know ride our boat at at full plane for however long we want to and and it's an annoyance that they're there and then you've got another equally if not more strong-willed group that are there to to uh fight for the manatees and and love the manatees and see them as as really the amazing creature that they are and and it seems uh especially in florida that 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 group is the one that really stands out and the really and the one that shines and and there's a lot of kind of civilian scientists that that really add to protecting this species so since i've left florida i haven't really been paying attention but i did remember seeing in the news that they were going to remove a lot of these protections that they've had in place with the manatees just based on, like you said, that half of the population that does not, you know, that finds them a hindrance. Do you know where we are with that? Um, so I was actually trying to, to look up some of that today. Um, cause I, I remember during the, uh, the kind of debacle of the downlistment from endangered to threatened, um, there was a lot of worry that we were going to lose a lot of the protections that, you know, we've spent so many years, putting into place and and that are really backed by a lot of hard science. Um, And then I do remember right after the downlistment, you know, watching the news that there were some proposals within, I guess, the local government to start doing away with some of these protections. Um, As far as I know, you know, unfortunately, I've I've been kind of the bad scientist with manatees and I haven't paid as much attention to it as I should have. But um, as far as I know, not really anything has been taken back or, or repealed or, or pulled back, um, and that a lot of those protections still uh, remain in place. Um, I could be wrong, and, and that's definitely something I, I was trying to look into briefly in the lab today. Um, and so it's a it's a little bit you know kind of heartening to know that that while a lot of that was you know, the worry is it seems that even the, the, the downlistment hasn't completely revoked all of those, those protections, which was, was a, a huge concern for us, you know, because a lot of it was, is once we lose the, the endangered um, status, which thankfully, you know, it, it, we didn't lose it completely there. They only got downlisted to threatened, but they still are protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, alongside the Endangered Species Act. And so they still do hold all the marine mammal protections um, afforded to any marine mammal, regardless of whether endangered or not. And so I haven't seen anything that's been uh, kind of pulled back and, and made more relaxed, but it wouldn't surprise me if kind of that, that squeaky wheel group it, that, that sees them as a hindrance, you know, the squeaky wheel is always the one that kind of gets the oil. Um, it, it wouldn't surprise me if over the next, you know, couple years, we start seeing uh, some of those trying to be pulled back uh, through local government. And I really hope that a lot of the scientists that have contributed to to the the science that backs up why we need those hold strong. And, and I hope we become an even louder group saying that, you know, we, we lost the fight for uh the downlistment, but we still need to afford them the protections because if, if we don't, if we lose those protections, we're only going to work ourselves right back into the situation that we faced and in, in why we put those protections in, in there in the first place. Right. Right. And it's, I think it's just a, a byproduct of the current political situation too, in the United States where it's just money talks and Florida is just such a unique environment, I guess, uh, not, a, a unique political environment, I should say, because you have a lot of these people from the Northeast or other parts of the country that come down there, you know, the, the snowbirds, we call them, and they carry a lot of weight, you know, politically 
and because they're rich and they have money. And so these local politicians want to make them happy. And so, you know, I think the locals there in Florida that do care have to be active and they have to be loud, right? Exactly. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And it's very nice to see that this these uh, kind of civilian scientists take a very active role in uh, monitoring and being involved and volunteering their time and effort with, you know, local, you know, whether it's a state park or uh, um, other facility or, or organization, you know, such as Save the Manatee Club or, um, I mean, they really take a, a huge effort in, in educational outreach and really kind of public service for these manatees. Right, right. And yeah, they're amazing. I mean, there's so many people, again, uh, I think before we started recording, I told you, just talking to someone like you and other people around the world that are doing or fighting the fight for animals. It's just amazing. There's so many groups out there. There's so many great people out there doing stuff. So, you know, thank you for what you're doing, Jonathan, for, for this species, because your work is going to be really important, I believe, uh, for their future. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I really, uh, I really think that, that this work kind of provides a good foundation to continue a lot of this research. And, and maybe one day it comes in as a, you know, um, I always kind of take a step back and I, I feel a little bit bad because I feel that it's very much a, just kind of a basic biological work, but that basic biology background and description and, and foundation really is what we build a lot of this conservation work off, off of, I believe. I mean, when I look at it, you know, I, I can find the timeline towards where the conservation, where that biology meets the conservation need. And whether that, that need is right now or 10 years in the future, you know, we'll have that information and, and be able to utilize it when the, when the time is right. Right, right. And, and it is the basic biology. If we don't have that foundation, you know, a lot of what we talk about in our podcast is, and just recently too, like we've been talking about mammoth cloning and Tasmanian tiger cloning and that stuff. But some of these other advanced reproductive t techniques, you know, if you don't have that basic biology, you can't use them, you know? <laughs> exactly. And and I, I think, you know, especially with marine mammals, sometimes, um, you know, it really comes to light in the fact that, you know, as a scientist, we're not, we're not always the, the best, best either. You know, we, we can't always be amazing superheroes with every species as much as we try. And, you know, sometimes we wait just a little too long to intervene with the species. And we kind of pass that critical point where our involvement is just a little too late. Um, and so what my hope is, is if there was a point like that with the, the West Indian manatee or, or particularly the Florida manatee that we have that, that we don't wait until the last minute to have the information available to us that we can go back and say, we've done the work and whether it's needed now or needed later, the information is there. And, and those researchers at that time can take what we've done, build upon it, make it better if possible and, and use it to actually intervene and, and provide a conservation aspect for the species. That's a, that's an incredible, amazing point, Jonathan. Like, Oh wow. Again, this is why I love doing this. That is so true. That is so true. I mean, if you look at what's going on with the Vaquita right now, it's too late. It's a prime example. Um, you know, and it's, it's a wonderful you know, I don't want to take credit away from them at all. It's a, it's a wonderful time. The, uh, you know, the fact that they, they went out there and, and tried. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, with what, 30 something, you know, 30 mm -hmm. or, or Less, 32 yeah. Less, individuals yeah. left, you know, at that point, it is a, a sometimes a little too late. Um, and and there, are, there are probably examples where I'm completely wrong at that, where, you, you go in with that many and, and it's a successful turnaround. And, and those are, you know, kind of miracles that happen. And, and those are the ones that we kind of rejoice about. Um, but, you know, sometimes we have to be more proactive in, in our, in our um, research and in our efforts and a little less reactive. You know, we, we reacted to the fact that there were 30 individuals left and maybe we should have intervened when there was a hundred, you know, left and, 
Um, I mean, there's so many logistical aspects to that, and, and I have absolutely no involvement. I'm, I'm taking a, a pure outsider perspective. I, I'm, you know, it's easy to to look from the outside in, um, and but you know, sometimes we have to be a little bit more proactive in, in what we're doing, and that's that's where you know I, I really feel like with with my research is we, we're being proactive. There there is no captive breeding for for manatees in in the u.s right now and and so you know some people would look at me and say well what's the need for this well you know my my answer and and it's certainly developed as i've progressed through this research is you know the fact that okay maybe there is no no captive breeding at the moment but you know it is a somewhat inbred population in florida and you know, what happens when the genetic diversity is, is too low in, in the species, whether that ever happens or not. Um, but if it does, shouldn't we shouldn't we have kind of solved the problem or began to solve it way before it was a problem? Right. No, that's, yeah, again, another amazing point. Before we jump into kind of the nuts and bolts on what you're doing specifically in your research, I, I, I would like to ask you, how difficult is it to work with marine mammals as far as doing research? You know, I, I've listened to you and, and I know what you're doing and I've listened to some of the struggles, but maybe you can tell some of the researchers the difficulty in working with the man- manatee specifically, you know, uh, you know, some of the, the hurdles that you've had to overcome. Well, I, I mean, out of the marine mammals, I would certainly say the manatee is probably one of the easiest because Florida has set up such an amazing collaborative network between all of its entities, you know, Fish and Wildlife uh, Conservation Commission and through UF and USGS. And, and so there really is kind of a tight knit manatee community throughout the state of Florida that has allowed for, you know, samples to be taken and work to be, you know, research to be conducted. And, and so I would definitely say that out of marine mammals, manatees are certainly the easiest, but as an encompassing group, marine mammals are, are a very difficult group to work with. Just, um, you know, like I said, they're not only protected by the Endangered Species Act, but they're protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which, um, you know, you deal with a lot of red tape just to, to be able to collect the samples you need, whether they're readily available or not. Um, and with that too comes, you know, the, the um, kind of the dreaded sample size number, you know, do we have enough, do we have enough samples? And, and that was, you know, that was certainly a lot, you know, your background and interest with exotic species is why I, I kind of sought you out of, as a, a, uh, you know, collaborator and committee member for this research was because, you know, out of animal sciences, you seem to be just about the only one that was that that understood the the difficulties, you know, it is. I don't, I, I don't have a 100 manatees that I can yeah. go out and manipulate, you know, and, and so the, you know, while those dog and mice and, and uh, cow and pig people have it, a lot easier mm-hmm. than they they probably know it. Um, you know, they're they're certainly the ones that come back and, and ask us why we're not doing everything that sh- should be done. And a lot of it's because we can't do it. Right. Uh, you know, and there's right. just simply a lot of things that we we can't do. Um, but I think if you talk to a marine mammal biologist or researcher, one of the things that you will find is that we have a pretty good aptitude for finding our way around those methodology issues and those those logistical issues to get the samples we need and to get the the uh you know the appropriate uh kind of setup and experiment or or observation i mean we're when you're when you're faced with the difficulty of always having to be at the hard end of the stick you know not having an easy route to go you you find the best you find kind of an alternative that gets the same answer as, as what you would have with, with some of these other things. And it's pretty miraculous, you know, some of the ingenious techniques that marine mammal researchers have come up with and the, the beautiful data that they've produced um, by coming up with these techniques. And a lot of them just start as a rough idea that, that these researchers have, have polished and they, they took a, a gamble and, you know, they thought it through and, you know, they really come up with, with some amazing things and, 
Um, I mean, especially with, with manatees is one of my biggest issues is, is sample size. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, especially with semen characterization and, and collection, um, we're having to find a, a way around that. And, and so, you know, we currently have one animal that we've, we've characterized the semen for. Well, you, know, you can't make any conclusive, uh, you know, or any conclusions at, at a population level, you can simply say that for this individual and who's to say we don't have the oddball of the, of the entire population. Yeah. <laughs> um, and those are certainly things that we have to consider. And there are always things that are at the back of our minds, you know, and they're the things that people um, really kind of, you know, I don't want to say berate, but, you know, for lack of a better word, that's a lot of our pushback is, you know, how do you know you don't have that weirdo? Well, we don't. We just sometimes we can't say we can't make a conclusion at a population level, but, you know, we can start building the foundation. You know, it, every every brick matters in the foundation. And so every brick we lay is something to continue to build off of. And, you know, so especially with, um, you know, part of my research with sperm structure, looking at ultrastructure or morphology or just looking at, you know, redefining the morphometrics uh, of the, the sperm itself, we've combined post-mortem collections, you know, collecting sperm from sexually adult um, or sexually mature adult males from the vast deference. We've combined that with what we see in whole semen that we collected from that one individual. And how do those kind of link up? Are we seeing any differences? And, and at the moment, you know, we're not seeing anything we're, we're not seeing big differences. And so we, we have a pretty good confidence that our postmortem ones are, are uh, just as good as our whole semen. And so instead of having one animal, we're up to five at the moment. And I'm really hoping to be up to 10 at the end. And, um, you know, while it would be nice to have a hundred manatees to collect from, um, you know, it's probably, uh, I'll be very excited if at the end of the day, I, I have 10 that I, I can put in my dissertation. And just to explain for the listeners, this is groundbreaking work. Like nobody else in the world has done this before. So what Jonathan's trying to do, no one else has done yet. And he's describing some of the difficulties as far as how many manatees are in captivity. And then not only do you have to think about that, there are some manatees in captivity that are rescued and things like that. But you know, how many of them can you actually go in and, and manipulate? And Jonathan, you know, we do talk a lot of repro in this podcast, so don't f hold back, I guess. <laughs> it's, we warned the listeners, like, especially the last, I think the hyena episode was more female anatomy. So it's okay. It's okay. Their, their ears are kind of used to some of the stuff. So just to help the listeners understand the science behind it, when you do research, you usually like a large population size because if you're getting averages and you want to make conclusions on, say, what's happening in humans or chimpanzees or elephants or manatees, you try to get as many different animals as possible and look at the average. And then you make conclusions. Well, what Jonathan's running into is we don't have that hundred or even ten manatees that he can work with. So he's doing what he can to break ground and, and you explained it beautifully. So, so one of the, I know one of the difficulties you, can you talk about CITES real quick, you know, the CITES permits. I remember in the very beginning you were, you were talking with Dr. Larkin and, Oh, we got to get CITES permits to work with animals in Mexico. So like you said, with the red tape, this is very heavily regulated because these animals are so protected, right? It, it certainly is. And, and it's, it's very heavily regulated from a, a United States background. I mean, we, the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act really only applies in the, in the United States. And so in order to get these samples outside of the United States um, or, or any of its territories, and that's why we're able to actually go to Puerto Rico and collect these, you know, get these samples and bring them back is because we're still in a U.S. territory. So we're still technically part of the U.S. Um, but if we wanted to go to Mexico and get some samples and bring those back. It's a pretty hefty, uh, you know, mound of paperwork that you have to go through justifying, you know, what you're doing exactly, how many, what samples you're getting, how many you plan to bring, um, and and it takes a, a decent amount of time. I mean, it's a it's a very time limiting uh, obstacle, um, especially for somebody 
you know, like me, that that was, you know, at that moment that we were discussing that was in its third year of the PhD. And, and by the time we probably would have gotten that CITES permit, I, I would have been close to my graduation. Um, so it's, it's not an easy feat to get this. And, and those, that, those, you know, restrictions are there, uh, you know, they're in place for a reason. And so um, while it is a little bit inhibitory, the, the background behind them and, and the, the reason for them is wholly justified. Um, it's just, it, it takes a while and, and, you know, we were hoping that we'd be able to work under, you know, somebody else's CITES and, um, it just, it, it just at the moment didn't pan out. Um, and, and for other reasons, just beyond CITES, but it, it really is a, a, a big thing when it comes to the red tape. And that's one of the big, you know, restrictions that a, a lot of us face is making sure that we fall within the set guidelines um of of everything right and it's and the purpose of of bringing that up is you know so people don't think in science especially in conservation science it's not the wild west where you can just go out and do whatever you want you know oh it certainly is it certainly is not it's far from it i mean it's very very heavily uh i would say you know regulated and and there's a lot of checks and balances that that are in place both at an institutional level or um and at a, a, a state and federal level, depending on the species that you're working with. No, and it, it, it is. So it's reassuring, you know, especially with, you know, within the United States. And I believe, you know, my opinion is we still need to keep those in place and not loosen a lot of these regulations as some of the politicians are talking about, you know, because I think in the end, you know, it may help you, the scientist, but it also helps people in the black market and people that trade in, in you know, elephant tails and things that have been in the news uh, with, with this current uh, political climate. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, though, while, while it, it is a bit frustrating at, on, at the scientist level, you know, having to spend many, many hours and, and you know, being very frustrated, trying to make your way through this maze of, of regulatory paperwork that it, you know, like you said, it's there for a reason and, and we're doing this for a reason. And the reason that some of these species are, are hanging on as long as they, they have been is because of the regulations that we put into place. And, um, you know, it's, it's my belief as the scientists that, that we should definitely be held to a very high level of, of obeying, uh, you know, and following a lot of these regulations, um, kind of setting, setting the example, you know, it's just like you would, you know, at least in my belief, I would expect a law enforcement officer to be obeying traffic laws and, and anything that he would stop me for, I would expect him not to be doing. And I, I, I do want to come back to some of the pressures that manatees are facing, but I think this is a good point to kind of get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts on what you're doing and, and maybe talk about, cause I think some of the stuff is just, I don't know, maybe it's just cause I'm too geeky with, with reproductive biology, but you know, like when you went to Africa and you were working with prof and collecting rock hyrex and now, you know, with Danielle and some of her elephant stuff that they're doing, can you just explain to the listeners? I mean, some of the, the geeky science behind, you know, I guess the ultra structure and, and why, why, why you're doing that? Uh, definitely. I, I mean, I, I, I totally kind of geek out about my research yeah. as well. And, and it, yeah. it's even, it, it's even better that it is reproductive related because, you know, especially when you give a presentation, you can definitely, you, you can see all the people that start to blush in the audience when you start <laughs> talking about these subjects and, and that kind of eggs you on as you keep going. But, um, a lot of what I'm doing, I mean, I'm, I'm really trying to, so, for, for the Florida manatee, you know, and, and I'll, I'll touch on the, the hyrax and the elephant as I, as I kind of go along and, and build the story. But in the Florida manatee, there's really not a whole lot out there regarding male reproductive physiology. Um, and so there's, if I'm not mistaken, over the past decade, from about 1995 to 2015, um, there were about five publications of, um, on, on really focused on male reproductive physiology in the West, in, in the West Indian or or more specifically the Florida manatee. So we, we have, you know, we have an understanding of the reproduction, but when it comes to reproductive physiology, we're very, very centered around, uh, female reproductive physiology because, 
you know, there is a lot of belief that it really lies on the female for a lot of this. And, and, you know, my, my thought is on that is it takes two to tango. There, there are two sides to this story. And if you have an amazing female with great reproductive biology and you have a really poor male, it still doesn't add up, you know, so you need good quality from both sides. And so, um, you know, there, there was one paper on looking at sperm structure and after that, really nothing centered, you know, really even on, on sperm or semen. And nobody really thought we were going to be able to get semen from a manatee in the first place. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is really start characterizing some of these semen parameters. And so volume uh, of, you know, an ejaculation and an average ejaculation. So while we were in Puerto Rico this last time, we were there for two weeks. Um, over that two-week period, we were able to get seven different uh, ejaculates. And so, you know, we looked at volume. We looked at uh, pH of the semen, uh, which was remarkably higher than what we, we imagined. Um, it, it was definitely higher than what we see in the, in the elephant. Um, we looked at, you know, kind of the color and appearance of it. What's the concentration, you know, for this individual – um, you know, and this, this links back to, you know, if you want to look at domestic animals like horse or, or bovine, you know, cattle and that for, for breeding purposes, you know, a lot of them look at the concentration of that ejaculate to figure out, you know, what's the, the breeding dose and how much do you, you know, do you put in and, and is this a good sample? Is it concentrated? Is there a lot of sperm in it or is there not that many sperm? And so, you know, we looked at the concentration of every ejaculate. We looked at, um, we did volume, pH, concentration. We looked at motility. Motility was one of the biggest parameters that we did. And we were able to use a computer-aided sperm analysis system um, to do that. And so we look at all the sperm that are moving, you know, to calculate our total motility. And then how many of those sperm are actually moving in a forward uh, pathway. So, you know, some of these are swimming in circles. Some of these are kind of vibrating in place. Um, and then some of these are swimming quite quickly across the screen. And so we're, we're looking at, you know, not only looking at just basic motility, what, you know, how many, what's the percentage that are moving, but what are the different kinematic properties of, of each ejaculate, you know, each sample. And so how many of this population are swimming at a rapid velocity, at a medium velocity, or at a low velocity, and how many of these are immodal? And so this system is it's an amazing system. And, and one of the biggest perks of it is the fact that we are able, it, it's mobile, it, it's portable, so we can take it wherever we want to. Um, and so, you know, we looked at that, we looked at hyperactivation of the sperm. Um, and then we also, you know, one of the things that we did was a, a small pilot study, looking at liquid storage and cryopreservation. So, you know, to our knowledge, you know, and I don't, I don't want to, talk too far on but you know we we cryopreserved two samples and so you know i don't know anybody that that has cryopreserved manatee semen before um much less anybody that's really gotten a uh, seven ejaculates and so this is really exciting work because we're we're just kind of in in a vast expanse of all these different pathways that we can travel along and keep doing research on it you know they're wide open you know, and so a lot of this is leading to that conservation aspect and the fact of if we know how to collect it and we know how to store it and we know how to store it indefinitely through cryopreservation, you know, then the next steps would be artificial insemination and, you know, monitoring through pregnancy. And so, um, you know, one of the biggest things that we have to do, you know, even though it was a small pilot study, it gave us a wicked amount of information that, that we're sifting through at the moment. Um, but we have a really good route on how to optimize cryopreservation in manatees, how we optimize, you know, how we are going to make this a lot better and a lot more feasible. Um, and even, you know, collection method, um, you know, we really, we really define some of the, the necessary uh, ins and outs of, of the, the collection method while we were down there. And so it, it's just, it's, it's really exciting because from, from point A to point B, you know, there's just nothing that, that really is there.
there yet. There's no information. And so we're really just kind of writing the book on, on everything between, between that. So, yeah, to- I mean, absolutely. Cause you don't, you know, one of the things we always talk about, we always have a repro segment and a lot of what we know in animal reproduction is through our domestics and there is no domestic counterpart to the manatee. So you have to do techniques that we've done in cows and done in horses and some of these other species and see if they work. And then if they don't, then you start troubleshooting and it's a long, long, long road. So, you know, you're right. You know, you are doing some of the very first ever in manatees, which is amazing. It's amazing, Jonathan. It's amazing. It's very exciting. Um, and, and you're exactly right. A lot of what we know is, is from domestics. And, and we're very lucky to have that research to build upon. You know, a lot of this was figured out in domestics and and kind of trans, translated over into marine mammals and adapted for, for their use and better refined and, and all of that. But, you know, it, it's all off of that kind of domestic backbone. Um, it just takes us a little longer to get there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the, the things I love talking about on the show, too, is evolution and the history of animals. And, and I do that for many reasons. Not only do I think it's interesting, but I also want people to get an appreciation for like how old the species is. And so when they go extinct, it's just heartbreaking. You know, like I literally could make myself come to tears if I think about some of these animals too long. Because it's taken millions of years to get where they're at. But the, the other aspect is, I just find it fascinating. So one of the things you were looking at is comparing sperm cells with the rock hyrex, which is, I like to describe as like this little rodent that's, you know, it's got teeth. <laughs> it's a vicious little thing. It, it definitely, yeah. it's, it's more bite than it is bark. Yeah, yeah. So you have the rock hyrex. Then you have this mammal that lives in the water, the manatee. And then you have the largest terrestrial mammal, the elephant. And they're all closely related. It's certainly a very, very odd phylogeny. Um, you know, the, the manatee, the elephant, I can definitely see. Um, instead of the hyrax, I probably would have thought a hippo or a rhino. Um, that, that would have been my guess. Um, but... You know, evolution is a, a funny, a funny thing, and it, it's just a, a very, very weird grouping there. Um, but you know, through our research, we've certainly found uh, a lot of very cool similarities. You know, not not only limited to the sperm cell, but even just at you know the reproductive anatomy of these animals. And so, you start to see some really cool trends uh, going on between these and. Uh, one of the neat things that we found, you know, we, we're doing a lot of gross anatomical descriptions as well as histology with the rock hyrax, uh, with the reproductive tract. And if you look at it and you look at what's been published with the African elephant, uh, the reproductive tracts are very, very similar uh, in the way that they appear. And it, it threw us off a little bit. And you know, it was very, very exciting when we when we looked at the histology and we kind of put the puzzle pieces together and we went back to what Prof had done in elephants. And and when we compared them, they were almost exactly alike, just at a smaller scale, you know, in the in the rock hyrax. And then you start looking at the manatee and the manatee has, um, you know, in the epididymis, the epididymis in the manatee is a little bit unique um, in, in its appearance. And as we've kind of read through the literature and we've, we've looked at it, you know, it's almost like the reproductive track of the manatee is slowly catching up to what we see in the elephant and the rock hyrax. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, maybe, you know, if, if they make it another million years, maybe in a million years, as, as they evolve, maybe all three of those will have an identical looking, you know, gross anatomical appearance for for the reproductive tract, but it, it's, it's interesting to see the puzzle pieces starting to put, you know, to, to kind of fit together between this, this clade of animals. Right. Right. I mean, just one of the characteristics that came to my mind is they have internal testes, right? And then when you looked at the ultra structure, which ones again were 
most closely related, the Hyrex in Elephant or the Elephant in Manatee? If 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 I'm remembering correctly, because yeah. I'll be honest, it's been just a little bit since I looked at the Ultra Structure. We're we're slowly working our way back into that one, but yeah. I believe the the Ultra Structure of the the sperm itself looked more closely related between the Hyrex and the Manatee, but the overall yeah. appearance of it at you know um, at a gross level, at a morphological level, the uh, elephant and the manatee looked more uh, closely related. Um, and right. there, there was some really interesting ultrastructural similarities between you know all three of them. Um, especially you know they they all three have a very high content of mitochondria within the midpiece and. Um, you know, the rock hyrax sticks out a little bit because it's got, uh, you know, more of a, uh, spherical looking, you know, or a circular looking head, whereas the, the elephant and the manatee are more oval shaped. And so it, it's just, it, it kind of gave us more questions than answers, uh, you know, trying to answer some of these, you know, who is more closely related to who. Um, but it, it, it kind of excites you too, because it leads you down additional paths. And so you, you started in one place and and you got those, you know, you got those, those results and it it gave you two or three more questions to kind of venture down. And and that was the exciting part of it all is, you know, while it would have been nice to, to say, you know, elephant and manatee or elephant and hyrax or manatee and hyrax are all, are they're the close, the most closest related. It it was just, it, it kind of, puts a smile on my face just thinking, you know, I, I get excited talking about it and, and realizing that I get to go in the lab every day and work with these and, and kind of think about it just a little bit more. But, you know, we, we're, we're venturing down kind of this phylogenetic relationship and every, every step we make, it, it gives us a little bit of the answer, but it makes us question even more what, what's going on. Right. And it's like, I, I you know, when we started going down this path a few years ago, it, you know, we had this debate. What, you know, did the manatee leave the oceans to become elephants? You know, their their ancient ancestors, or did like an ancient elephant ancestor go to the water and become the manatee? And we, yeah, it was an interesting discussion. I was like, I always thought, oh, you know, the mammal or they came out of the water onto the land, but. Dr. Larkin was like, uh, who's to say that it didn't go the other way? And I was like, you're right. You know, yeah. exactly. Well, and then you throw in this, this, you know, oversized Guinea pig. Where does, where does it fit into the mix of, of all of that? It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. It's such an oddball. It's weird. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, just to kind of wrap up with, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I, I could, uh, these interviews, I could do this for hours. You know, one of the things I, I, you were talking about earlier as far as the mortality in boat strikes, but you also said it was interesting was, you know, I know during the winters in Florida, getting bitterly cold, there's a lot of manatee death, right? They come into the springs to stay warm during the winter months. The people you work with, have they noticed the last few years? Has that number gone up or down? Um, I I. I honestly don't know if it's it's gone up or down. I, I haven't heard anything that we we've reached more or less. I would I'm assuming that it stayed relatively. You know, we have our uh, our our natural kind of cycles up and down mm-hmm. every year. Um, I think that as the you know one of the biggest concerns is once some of these power plants either shut down or they convert over, and we don't have that warm water effluent that a lot of these manatees rely on. If we, you know, what's going to happen to those, mm-hmm. um, you know, there, there is, you know, some, some bit of site fidelity where, where some of these manatees are going to the same warm water sources, be it a natural source such as a spring or a man-made source such as the warm water effluent off of a power plant. Um, and, and so, you know, once those warm water effluents are no longer available, what are we, you know, what are the going to be the consequences at a population level, you know, mm-hmm. because it, it will be a significant uh, change in the environment for for those manatees during the winter time period when they're most uh, vulnerable. No, it, it it's a good point, because, you know, 
as man or humans, you know, we, we, we change the environment and animals adapt and then we take that away from them all of a sudden, you know, that's probably going to lead to a spike in mortality. I would, I would assume. It, it, it probably will. Um, and you know, I think one of the biggest things is, is this is certainly where, where science is being proactive rather than reactive. I, I think that, um, when it comes to the manatee, because it is relatively well studied in Florida, um, you know, there, that concern has been around for a while. And so, you know, hopefully we'll see progress that's made on, on kind of figuring out what, what's to be done, you know, when those, when those warm water effluents are no longer available. You know, it's a little outside my, my study range, but it's certainly yeah, yeah, something yeah. that we have to, we all, you know, we all have to be aware of. And, you know, the, the juveniles are the, are the most susceptible age group during the winter time periods. You know, they're relatively naive. Uh, some of those have, have just been weaned off from mom. They, they may not know where to go for, for warm, you know, for, mm-hmm. to seek warm water. Um, and so we definitely see a spike in juvenile mortality during these, these winter months when the, when the water dip gets just a little too cold for them. And so that will definitely be our most susceptible population uh, when those warm water effluents are no longer available. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things I always love to ask people that are, you know, dedicating their lives to this, that, you know, you work in the lab every day, you know, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. I I know that. (laughs) So how do we convince others that your work, it's worth saving the manatee? You know, it's not just, you know, the global view, but let's just look at the manatee. Why should we pour millions of dollars or whatever amount of money we do into saving this one species? You know, from your perspective, why are they that important? Um, Well, you know, not just limited to to manatee. I kind of want to start a little bit broad here and maybe focus down to manatees. But, you know, at, at any species level is what right as humans do we have to to decimate their population. You know, I, I don't think that, you know, as a human, we have the right to, to knock out any species that's kind of in our way that, you know, is, is kind of in the pathway or an obstacle or, or it stops us from doing what we want to do. You know, this, this planet isn't made for just humans. It's a huge, huge biodiverse system that all works in sync together. And, if we keep going at the level that we're going and and wiping these species out that, you know, we're not going to have anything left. And, you know, especially with the manatee and and a lot of other marine mammals, and especially in the United States, I think it's hard sometimes to convince people that we should protect them because we don't use them as a food source and we don't, you know, use them as this or that, like maybe we do fish, you know, there, there's no fishery for marine mammals there, you know, there's no, um, products that we get from them, you know, but a lot of it is, you know, look at the ecotourism that manatees provide, uh, especially in Crystal River. Crystal River, Crystal River thrives off of ecotourism for manatees. Uh, you know, they've got a beautiful spring system. Um, that's, you know, if you type in snorkel with manatees, the first place that's going to pop up is Crystal River, Florida. Um, so that, that's just, that, that area within itself has been built off of, of, you know, the ecotourism surrounding the manatee. Um, if you go out to Monterey Bay, California, look at the, you know, the, the whale watching that occurs. So there's a lot of ecotourism that, that really comes in and, and allows you the opportunity to appreciate the, these animals in their, their natural environment. Aside from that, it, you know, my thing is, is they're here, you know, why, why shouldn't we protect them? Mm -hmm. A lot of the activity, you know, that, that causes their mortality is, is human related. You know, we're, they're losing their habitat. They're being hit by boats. Their, their demise is, is a lot of times our cause. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, to me, if it was a natural extinction that was, devoid of human activity, I think somebody would have an argument for saying, why should we be stepping in and and interrupting kind of mother nature's plan? Mm -hmm. But, you know, as with a lot of other species, their, their declines are, are directly related to human activity. And so I think when you turn it around, we have an obligation to protect the species that we're in turn hurting. 
No, yeah, it's a great point. It's a great point. You know, again, we have a moral obligation, you know, to, to save these animals. Uh, final question, you know, where can listeners help the manatee or, or help your research? Um, I, you know, um, for a lot of that, there's a lot of really good organizations uh, across the state of Florida, um, such as Save the Manatee Club or Fish and Wildlife Conservation Con- um, Commission. Um, I know Save the Manatee Club takes, you know, a lot of, of donations and there's a lot of kind of civilian scientists do that. And so, you know, outside of Florida, you know, there, there's ways to be involved. Um, educational outreach, just being educated about the species really helps. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of good organizations that, that really contribute to manatee conservation and, and being involved in any number of those, um, you know, or even if you if you're able to have a you know educate somebody about the species you know the best thing that we can do is provide an education you know educating uh the population on on the species um you know generally i feel like anytime you have a good background knowledge of something you appreciate it just a little bit more and you understand it a little bit more and you know you may be more apt to follow that slow speed uh boating zone if if you know that Hey, we should be keeping an eye for manatees because I, I sure would hate to to hit one with with my outboard motor as I ignore, you know, as, as I'm going through this waterway. And so, you know, being aware and, and being involved, um, you know, as cliche as that that sounds, no, um, but it's important. It, it certainly is important, and and Florida provides a vast opportunity to be able to do that, whether you're in Florida or or outside of it. Jonathan Cowart. <laughs> I will keep the listeners up to date on your progress you know, over the next year as you get ready to uh, finalize your research. And I've brought you up before in a few of the pods, and I will in the future because it's just amazing work that you're doing. Thank you for including me in it, and thank you for doing this interview. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, you know, it just kind of at the last thing to say is, you know, uh, I appreciate your support through it, you know, both. Um, you know, emotional and, and research wise. And you know, I appreciate a lot of the people that have contributed to it. You know, I know you, I'm sure you've talked about Danielle quite a bit as well. I mean, she's been a major collaborator uh, and, and driving force in this research too. And so I certainly wouldn't have been able to get as far as I have with, without her and uh, the numerous people that, you know, we collaborate with and, and they all kind of bring a different level of excitement to it and a, and a different viewpoint. And so you know, as with any science, it, it's not just an individual thing. It, it, it's it, it's a highly collaborative effort that, that really brings a lot of people together. No, that's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. Well, take care, Jonathan, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. All right, take care.